Please remain standing for reading of God's Word this morning. Our text is found on 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, arrogance of life is not from the Father but is from the world. And the world along with its desire is passing away. But whoever does, does the will of God remains forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord God, we come into your presence, Lord, with gratitude, humble gratitude, Lord, and we give you all praise and glory and honor because of who you are, for what you have done and for what you have accomplished, Lord, on our behalf, Lord. We thank you. Lord, we rejoice this morning. We celebrate this morning, Lord, because you are our King and our Lord and our Savior, Lord. And, Lord, there is nothing better, there is nothing greater than knowing you, Lord. Your word said that blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not count against him, whose sins are forgiven, Lord, because of your perfect obedience, your perfect sacrifice, the one that we could not do, Lord. You have done it for us, Lord, and now we stand in awe of you, Lord. And, Lord, uh, you are, we just want to proclaim and confess that you are our joy, our righteousness, Lord. And in your presence, Lord, there is peace and joy and righteousness, Lord, and pleasure forevermore. And that's all we ever wanted, Lord. And Lord, we know that you have commanded us, do not love the world or the things of the world because the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the love of the world is passing away, Lord. But your word, Lord, remains forever, Lord. And uh, Lord, we thank you. So, Lord, this morning that we pray that we will be able to say with the psalmist, Lord, the Lord, whom have I in heaven but you? And Lord, there is nothing we desire in this world besides you, Lord. Our flesh and our heart, they fail, but you are the strength of our life, Lord. So, Lord, we pray now, Lord, that you will help us to be the light of the world as you are in the light. Now you commanded us to be the light of the world. Let our light shine before you, before men, that they may see our good works, Lord, and glorify our Father in heaven. So, Lord, uh, we pray that our, the works, the movement of our feet and our hands, Lord, and that the meditation of our heart, Lord, be acceptable to you, our Lord and our King and our Savior. And, Lord, we pray for the preaching of your word this morning that you will, uh, Lord, rest upon your spirit, will rest upon Pastor Joel. Lord, that you will, we will grant us, Lord, to see your, the beauty, your, your gospel to the, Lord, to the preaching of your word not only a pyramid of our, in our head, but embrace it with our heart, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning and a blessed Sunday for everyone here at Christ Church West Covina, precisely because we get to gather and get to worship and get to sing together the glories of our King and have this weighty privilege to hear God's word and be transformed, mindful that nothing less than the preaching of God's word uh, brings us to the presence of God because God's word is the embodiment of his presence. Remember that in the Ark of the Covenant, which signifies the presence of God, there are two items. It is the manna and the tablet, the Word of God, because it is the Word of God that sustains us, so man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so a tall order is before me this morning, as it is every Sunday, to preach God's Word, and let us have ears to hear and hearts to perceive the Word of God today, which is in 1 John <clears throat> chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, concluding now this particular section. As we have learned the arrival of the new covenant under the blood of Jesus, which we shall remember today with the Lord's Supper, no longer under the blood of bulls and goats, 
comes with a new commandment to love one another. Disobedience against this new commandment issues the curse of passing away from God's presence. Obedience, however, to the new commandment issues the blessing of remaining in God's presence forever. Hence the title to this morning's sermon, Remaining Forever, the Covenant Blessing for Obedience. Remaining forever, the covenant blessing for obedience. The blessing as a Christian is we get God, right? We get God. The gospel promise is not a promise of health and wealth. The gospel promise is the promise of God. If you turn away from your sin, if you trust in Jesus, you get God forever. And that is the good news. Now, before citing the covenant blessing for obedience, John first specifies the covenant curse for disobedience. Namely, if we love the world, instead of loving our neighbor as ourselves, we pass away, exiled from God's presence, which we see in verse 17. Here's the curse for disobedience, and the world, along with its desires, is passing away. The world is passing away because everything that is in the world is passing away. It is not from God. To be specific, the desires of the world in verse 17 is previously clarified in verse 16. That is, do not love the world or the things of the world for everything in the world what are the desires of the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the arrogance of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So this duality that John is most commonly known for. There is no gray area in John. There's light, there is darkness, there's above, there's below. Either you're a friend of God or you're a friend of the world. Either you are loving the world or you're loving your neighbor as yourself. So everything that is in the world, the lust arising from the flesh, which we learned last Sunday, is coveting. Because the word for lust is the same word for covet that we find in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Do not covet your neighbor's wife. Do not covet your neighbor's belongings his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. So the lust of the world is, in effect, idolatry, which we see in Colossians chapter 3, uh, because covetousness, Paul says, is idolatry. And if you recall then, the first commandment, which is a prohibition against idolatry, is the same commandment in the last commandment, the tenth commandment, which is coveting. Because coveting is idolatry. So sandwiching the Ten Commandments is a prohibition against idolatry. And right in the middle of the Ten Commandments is, what is the Fifth Commandment? So you have bookends of, of idolatry. In the middle of the sandwich is, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Why is that the middle? Because the way in which you show that there is only one God is that you trust in God alone. You rest in His provisions for you as good, as perfect, as all-satisfying. So what do you do to show that? You rest. You rest. So the way in which then we show there is no other God is you rest in contentment in God's provision for you. But it is not so with the world. The world is restless. It is not satisfied in God. So the second thing in the world is the lust of the eye, which we learned last Sunday. It is a hungry eye seeking to devour everything it sees. Like you didn't know you even wanted it until you saw it. Now I want it because my neighbors got it. Now, I want it because I saw it on the internet. I didn't know I needed it, but now I want it. The lust of the eye, which is the same as idolatry also. And then finally, the arrogance of life, 
Remember this word for arrogance of life, the word life, there's bios, and that, that occurs in chapter 3 of 1 John, where John uses uh, life as goods, worldly goods. So we think that the arrogance of life has to do with self-assurance from the accumulation of your worldly possessions. That's the arrogance of life. You are secure in this world. You have your pension. You have your 401k. And your security is in your finances. It's in your life's work. That's your identity. That's your assurance. Maybe your degree. Maybe your career. It's an accumulation of stuff in life. And it makes you prideful, arrogant. And if you love the world, you have three symptoms. Coveting with the flesh. Seeking to acquire everything your eye sees. And having assurance of what you've accumulated thus far. Do not Love the world. Why? Because the world, along with its goods, will pass away. So the negative commandment to the new covenant is what? Do not love the world. Right? And the positive commandment in the new covenant, which John says is the new commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how is it that the positive is love your neighbor and the negative is what? Do not love the world. What's up with that? Whereas the positive commandment focuses on selflessness to meet the needs of others as the concrete expression of our satisfaction in Jesus, the negative commandment exposes the selfishness of our desires. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the arrogance of life. The positive commandment then to love our neighbor as ourselves is all about Jesus meeting our needs. And the negative commandment to not love the world is all about Jesus does not meet my needs, therefore I have to look. Therefore, I have to covet. Therefore, I have to have assurance in what I can accumulate in my life. So they're very tightly connected. To not love the world is to be satisfied in Jesus. He meets my needs. And the way in which you show not loving the world is what? You love your neighbor as yourself. To pass away as a covenant curse is not new. Indeed, the Old Testament gives us the template or the blueprint of Israel's exile in 586 BC to understand the significance of the curse. A very famous psalm, Psalm 144. It is a National prayer for deliverance, because Israel is in captivity. And here the psalmist prays in verse 4, Man is like a breath. His days is passing away. The exact same verb that we find in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. The world is passing away. Exact same verb. Like a shadow. And then verse 5, Bow your heavens, O Lord. Here's the plea. It's sort of, um, uncomfortable to read the Psalms because when you translate it, you, you, you find that's a hitful imperative. Like you're commanding God? So we don't command God, we plea to God. But in you know, the grammar, is, it's a command. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and you come down. Touch the mountains so that they may smoke. These are all 
commandments to God. Flash forth the lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and rout them. The passing away of man in verse 4 embodies the passing away of Israel in the exile. Indeed, the command to come down, touch the mountain, send your lightnings and arrows, and put up smoke in the mountain is based upon man passing away. And that man passing away, if you read the context, is Israel's exile. They passed away in captivity by the Babylonians. So what is the psalmist asking? Bow the mountains. Make the mountains smoke. Send your arrows of lightning and thunder. Make everyone scared again. What is the psalmist asking? The psalmist is asking for the exodus. The psalmist is asking for deliverance. Because where is it in the Bible that God bent the mountains and God caused the mountain to be filled with smoke and thunder and lightning and a heavy, heavy fog came down upon the mountain. Where did that happen? Mount Sinai during the Exodus at the giving of the Ten Commandments. We see, for instance, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. And all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning of flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. You see the color font leading us back to the Exodus event. Well, verse 18 of Exodus chapter 20 may not be so popular among Christians in the church. Verse 17 is, you know what verse 17 is? Do not covet. Covet your neighbor's spouse or his house or his donkey or his ox or anything that is your neighbor. After the Ten Commandments is done, what happened? Thunder, lightning, smoke. God comes down on Mount Sinai. This is the pinnacle of God's Exodus event. This is what the whole signs and wonders of Egypt is all about. It's pointing to this. Remember Moses, when he was a fugitive because he killed an Egyptian. He ran and he became a shepherd. And when the Lord appeared to him with a burning bush, the Lord said, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to tell him, let my people go. And once he lets my people go, listen carefully, Moses, you will meet me back here on this mountain with my people, and you will worship me. So Exodus 20 is the fulfillment of the Exodus. They met God, where God told Moses, you will meet me here again. God's deliverance was complete. He rescued Israel from captivity. So why does Israel need rescuing? Because they were enslaved in Egypt. Tragically, as, we, as most of us know, right? 722, 586, the two deportation events in the Old Testament, 722, the Northern Kingdom, 586, the Southern Kingdom, Israel went back into captivity because of their disobedience, suffering the curse for disobedience, which is exile from God's presence. And the psalmist is asking, Lord, do another exodus. Lord, save us again. Lord, give us another Moses 
who will lead us out from captivity. When John therefore stipulates that the passing away as the consequence for loving the world instead of loving God, he is calling upon the Old Testament curse for disobedience. It's exile. It's deportation. It's passing away from God's presence. The world passes away. And contextually in John, it's not just the world that passes away, but also the lovers of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the arrogance of life. Those who love the world will pass away along with the world. In other words, you become the God that you worship. You become the God that you worship. That which you love is what you become. Psalm 115, this is all throughout the Bible. This is one of my assignments from G.K. Beale. He's written like three books now on this topic. Idolatry, you become the God that you worship. So we had to uh, translate Psalm 115. And it's kind of scary because my professor's old school. He still has the transparency, right? You guys remember the transparency? And then so he has the Hebrew text. And then he starts pointing at random students to translate. And then it's like, Joe, like, oh, no, here I go. And then he starts pointing. And you got to translate. And then he stops. Now conjugate this verb. Okay, that's a hiffle. So this brings back all these... Memories of Psalm 115. But this is one of our assignments. Verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. And here's the point. Those who make them become like them. Those who make them become like them. You become the God that you worship. That is why in Isaiah chapter 6, if you remember, one of the saddest commission for the ministry in the Bible it's also the commission of Jesus to those who don't understand the parables. But imagine being called to the ministry. And what is your ministry? God tells Isaiah, go and preach. Okay? So that they will have eyes, but they cannot see. So that they will have ears, but they will not hear. So that they will have hearts, but they cannot perceive, so that they cannot repent any longer. Imagine if that's your ministry. Your job, Isaiah, is to harden people's heart so that the exile will come. I don't want my people to repent anymore. I'm fed up. I'm sending the Babylonians Isaiah, go. Make the people's hearts dull, their eyes blind, their ears deaf. And then, at the end of Isaiah, with that commission, eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear, hearts but cannot perceive. And then Isaiah says, do this until the whole of Jerusalem is burned up. There's nothing left in all of Jerusalem except for one thing. You know what's left behind? According to Isaiah's commission, it shall be a stump, a terebinth, and it'll be smoldering with smoke. And the last thing that Israel will see when they look back with chains and ropes around their hand and, and, and feet making the long march towards Babylon, the last thing they see 
is a smoldering stump of a tree. And you know what that tree is? It's their idol. It's their idol. They became the gods that they worship. Like their tree, they cannot see. Like their hearts, they cannot perceive. Like their tree, they cannot hear. And like this tree is burned up in judgment, so Israel will be burned up in Babylon. You become the God that you worship. They have eyes, but they cannot see because they have the eyes of the world. They have hearts, but cannot perceive because their hearts is occupied with coveting the worldly goods. Now conversely, obedience to love or doing the will of God issues forth the covenant blessing of remaining in God's presence. Remaining in God's presence. The subtitle there should not be the world and the lovers of the world pass away. It should be they will remain in God's presence. So in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, and the world along with its desires is passing away, but whoever does the will of God remains forever. What is the will of God? Well, the context lets us know it is keeping the commandments of God. In verse 3, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments, if we do the will of God. In verse 5, doing the will of God is not only keeping God's commandments, but keeping his word. Whatever keeps his word does the will of God, obeys his commandment. In him truly the love of God is perfected. So how do we know that we know God? In verse 3, how do we know that we know God? It's not a circular question, because there is an answer when you obey His commandments. That's how you know you know God. How do you know that God loves me? That God's love is, perfect, is perfected in me? How do I know that? When you keep His commandments commandments. And verse 17, how do I know that I won't go to hell and perish along with the world? You do the will of God. John is consistent. You know you know God when you obey His commandments. You know God loves you when you obey His commandments. And you know you will not perish with the world when you obey His commandments. To remain in God's presence is the covenant blessing. The curse is exiting away from God's presence. And the blessing is remaining in God's presence. The principle for the covenant curse that those who worship idols become like their idols also carries over to the covenant blessing. Those who love Jesus will become like Jesus. Since Jesus lives forever as the resurrected Lord of the heavens and the earth, those who love Jesus shall also live forever. You become the God that you worship. So the lovers of the world will perish along with the world. And the lovers of Jesus will live forever because Jesus lives forever in his resurrected state. 1 John chapter 6, verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, right? That's the will of God, the will of the Father who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. What is God's will for, for Jesus? To save people. Save people. To resurrect people. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on that last day. The basis for the eternal life in verse 39 is the resurrected life of Jesus. In verse 57, as the living Father said to me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. Notice the yellow font. 
we become like Jesus. Not only in our character, which is in the book of Romans, we become the God that we worship. We are shaped and conformed to the image of Jesus in Romans 3 and Romans 8. But also we will have the same blessing of Jesus and that Jesus is resurrected. We will be resurrected also with Jesus. We become the God that we worship because Jesus lives, therefore I will live. Now let us close with the following challenge. The covenant curse for loving the world is to become like the world, partaking of the same fate of the world, which is to pass away from God's presence. The covenant blessing for loving Jesus is to become like Jesus. That is to live forever in God's presence with the resurrected Christ. Therefore, do not love the world, lest you become like the world and suffer the same fate as the world. You pass away. I don't know if you guys remember, like a two-year series on the book of Revelation. But one of the highlights there, from what I remember, is this phrase, those who dwell upon the earth. Used eight times in the book of Revelation. Never applied to Christians. Never applied to the churches. Never applied to believers. Only applied to unbelievers. Those who dwell upon the earth. Now why is that? Well, if you look up the usage of the dwellers of the earth, within its immediate context, you know what's there? If you remember, idolatry. Idolatry is in every occurrence of dwellers of the earth. And why is that? Well, because the dwellers of the earth find their security, their comfort, their hope, their assurance on earthly things. They're earth dwellers. Their hope is built upon the world. And you know what happens to the earth in the book of Revelation? Burned with fire. Along with what? Those who dwell upon the earth. What is John trying to tell us in the book of Revelation? You become the God that you worship. If your security is here on earthly things, everything in this world will burn. And you will burn along with the world. Because you are an idolater. You covet. You're not satisfied in Jesus. You have become the God that you worship. You are just like your idol. Eyes but cannot see. Ears but cannot hear. Hearts but cannot perceive. Remember Lot and his wife? Remember what even preceded Lot going to Sodom and Gomorrah? Abraham and, and Lot, they, their possessions, their donkeys and their herd and their animals got so big that they were fighting over the grass to eat. And so they said, well, we got to split up. We're just too rich now. We're too wealthy. We can't be in the same area. And Abraham says, I'll give you first dibs. You pick where you want to go and wherever you go, I'll go the opposite way. And Lot says, well, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like the most prosperous, fertile city of ancient Mesopotamia. 
Sodom and Gomorrah. And they stay there, and they got wealthy, and they become dwellers of the earth. And God tells Abraham, I will destroy the, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you remember the bargaining that Abraham said, Lord, if there are 50 righteous people, will you destroy the entire 50 righteous along with the wicked? He said, not for 50. If there are 50, fine. I won't. And then Abraham says, oh, I don't know if there's 50 righteous people. What about if there's 40, Lord? Will you destroy the entire city if there's 40 righteous people? Won't you at least save 40? Fine, I won't destroy if there's 40. And then they got all the way down to five. Lord, if there's five pe righteous people in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God says, fine, I won't destroy if there's five. And guess what? There was none. No righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, I will burn this city down. Fire from heaven. And so, the angel appeared in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And we get how bad it is in Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels came and what happened? The man of the city wanted to rape the angels. Wanted to rape the angels because they were a good looking man. That's how bad it was. And you know how bad it got? All the men in the city were knocking at the door and what does Lot do as a good dad? Here's my daughter, rape my daughter instead, but don't rape the angels. Kicks her daughter out. Can you imagine doing that as a dad? No righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, I will burn this down. Lot, you pack up and you go on one condition. Do not look back. Because what does looking back mean? You're longing for it. That's still your security. That's still what you really want. Don't look back. Because that which you look back will be judged. Don't look at that. Don't long for that. That's the lust of the eyes. Don't look at that. It's going to be judged. It's going to be burned. Don't look. So Lot and his wife left, running. And what does life wife do? She looks back. And what happened to Lot? She became the God that she worshipped. She was reduced to a pillar of salt. Becoming the God that she worshipped. Do not love the world or the things of the world for the love of the Father is not in you if you love the world. For everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, is not from the Father. But whoever does the will of God remains forever. And everything that is in the world, along with its desires, will pass away. Let's call on the elders to please come forward so we can partake of the Lord's Supper in response to God's word.